Warning, this video contains details and information that some may find triggering and disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. American actor Stephen Collins was born October 1, 1947 in Des Moines, Iowa to parents Cyrus and Madeline Collins. He was the youngest of three boys and awfully shy growing up. As a child, his family relocated from Iowa to Hastings, New York, where his father worked as an airline executive and his mother a homemaker. Though reserved, Stephen was described as a well-rounded boy who was polite and mannerable. He came from a loving family and all seemed well. Unfortunately, when he was just 10 years old, a much older woman used him by repeatedly exposing herself to him over the span of five years. I did have someone in my life when I was between the ages of about 10 and 15, an older woman, who repeatedly exposed herself to me. This was an intense situation for the young Stephen, but he never considered himself to be a victim or that this much older woman who was stripping completely nude in front of him was doing anything wrong. In his mind, he considered her to be a trusted adult, and he didn't fully comprehend the magnitude of what she was doing to him. In an interview with Katie Couric, Collins recounts the following story. She lifted her shirt. What, do, what does that mean exactly? Um, being in various states of undress or complete undress. And this happened on several occasions. Yes, Quite a few times. Because I never felt like I was molested. It never occurred to me. That word never crossed my mind as a 10 to 15 year old boy. It was, it was a very intense experience. But I think somewhere in my brain, I got the equation of, well, this isn't so terrible. I mean, this person who I trust uh, is, is doing it. He never reported this traumatic experience to his parents or local authorities. He kept it a secret and never spoke about it with anyone until future allegations of him and young girls came to the surface decades later. Collins attended Hastings High School, where he played basketball, was elected to the National Honor Society, joined a rock band, and starred in a few plays. It was the 60s, and with Beatlemania present, rock and roll music was taking off. A long-haired Stephen wasn't your typical all-around American teenage boy. He was different, with a unique look, and often stood out from the crowd. People can't believe this, but in 63, 64, no kind of all-American kids were playing in rock and roll bands in high school. The Beatles came in, and then suddenly everybody wanted to play in a band, and I was one of them. And we were like the first band to play in a high school. Yeah, no, just prior to you, there's doo-wop groups on the street right. corners, but no one's right. playing instruments. And, and if there was a band at a Hastings High dance, it was guys from Yonkers in purple tuxedos, you know, <laughs> literally, who were probably 40, you know. And so when we got up and started playing high school bands, I mean, the teachers I know all thought, oh, my God, Steve Collins, we've, they've, he's lost his mind. Well, they wrote you off. They, they, kind, of, they kind of did. And, but it was, God, it's, I think it sort of saved my life. It felt like it saved my life. Right. I was, I was a very, very shy kid. I wanted to act. I didn't really have the nerve to act. He was interested in theater, but due to his shyness, he was deathly afraid of getting up and performing in front of an audience. To help him overcome this fear, Stephen decided to join a rock band. And so getting up and playing in a band kind of got me through the first line of resistance. And I didn't lead, I never, I didn't front the band in high school, so I just had minimal responsibilities. Right. But it was just a great way to get towards where I somewhere in the back of my mind wanted to get. After graduating from Hastings High School in 1965, Stephen was accepted into Amherst College studying English literature. Music was still his passion and became an outlet for the withdrawn young adult. While in college, he used this opportunity to nurture his artistic talents. Soon enough, he started writing his own music and performing with his band at various events. You joined a singing group, a cappella. Well, they had a triple quartet called the Zumbai. I'll say. Dave Eisenhower was in the Zumbais, as was I, and uh, he invited all of the Zumbais to his wedding, to, Ju to Julie Nixon. <laughs> Nixon was president-elect at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's interesting, because it probably if it had been a year or two later, people might have been less willing to go. After learning about the extensive reading requirements needed to graduate in the English program, Stephen felt it best to switch majors and pursue something else, theater. Because he had spent the past few years getting accustomed to performing in front of crowds, 
He felt that he had finally overcome his shyness and was ready to explore this avenue. I, I was an English major until senior year when they sent us a list of books that we said, you have to have read these books if you have any intention of passing English comprehensive exams. And uh, there was no way I, I had done like you lost 3% your, of that reading. You lost your intention. So I quickly switched to drama, which was known as one of the easiest majors there. And since I was acting in place, I thought, boy. And all you had to do to pass the drama comps was direct, it was, it was an oral exam, and then you, your thesis was you direct a play. Stephen didn't know much about directing, but was highly optimistic that with the help of some friends, he could pull it off, and he did. He was accepted into the drama program at Amherst College. In 1969, after graduating from college, Stephen was desperate to further his love for theater and jetted off to New York where he immediately immersed himself onto the New York stage. I'm about to graduate, I just... All I've ever wanted to do, because I grew up in Hastings, right outside New, York, outside New York, I just would give anything. I'll carry a spear. I'll do anything to be in Shakespeare in the You park. were that hip to say, I'll carry a spear? I did say that. And he, he said, well, send me a letter. Remind me of this conversation. He liked my performance. And a couple of weeks later, he called and he said, I've got a part for you. Don't get too excited. It's the smallest part in Shakespeare with a name. It's Valentine in Twelfth Night. He has three speeches. You know, I was two months out of school and I had three lines in Shakespeare in the Park and never was happier in my life, I think, to get a job. I can't imagine. $60 a week, I was like, flush. This was an amazing opportunity because it would open more doors in the acting world for him. His minor role in the Shakespeare's Twelfth Night of the De La Corte would earn him a spot in 40 Carats, a light Broadway comedy that ran in 1970. He had just married his first wife, Marjorie and was working with season director A. Burroughs on this production. So take two steps downstage, drop your head, and say the line. And do this in rehearsal thinking, I don't, okay. But he would insist on that. And the first time in front of an audience, two steps down, drop my head, say the line. Bam! Huge laugh. And in the moment of saying it, you realize, oh, it's funny. But it didn't never felt funny in rehearsal. But he, he could... You know, he could, like, you diagram a sentence, he could diagram a laugh. He, and if it, if it didn't work, he didn't rest until he got that laugh and you got that laugh. The more he thrust himself into this field, the more his passion, drive, and thirst for it grew. Acting became his sole purpose, and he utilized his time on the show to ask questions and gain further knowledge, experience, and techniques. I mean, when you learn from that level of a master, were you open to this education at the time? I mean, did it Oh, actually... I couldn't get enough of it. I mean, I, I, I think I, I just couldn't get enough of it. I knew, I had a natural instinct for getting laughs in front of an audience with, with a good script. It helps to have a good script. So to work with someone like that who could sense that you were on the edge of something and then turn it into like a yak, it's unbelievable. And, you know, it makes all the cliches, I have to tell you, comedy is the hardest thing in the world to do. And, and, um, so it takes a lot of thinking and a lot of preparation to be funny, just it's like anything business. else. It's very, very serious business. Yeah. Stephen's time on 40 Carats would land him more roles on several Broadway shows, and on the outside looking in, things were heading in a positive direction. He was married to a beautiful woman, booked several plays, and was soaking up such valuable information. What many didn't know was that Stephen had a secret, a very dark secret that had begun to manifest itself. He developed an inappropriate attraction towards minor girls. In 1973, after making a name for himself as an upcoming Broadway actor, Stephen exposed himself on several occasions to a 10-year-old girl who happened to be a relative of his then-wife, Marjorie. In his 2014-2020 interview, Stephen describes the incident saying, quote, I took her hand and moved it in such a way that she was touching me inappropriately. The first incident was in 1973. You were 25 years old. How old was the victim? She was 10. Tell us what happened. Well, in 1973, there were two occasions when I exposed myself to this young woman. And several months later, she came to visit, and she and I were watching TV alone together, and I took her hand and moved it in such a way that she was touching me inappropriately. I knew that 
something unthinkably wrong had just happened that I couldn't take back. And I, I think we both just sat there. We really didn't move a muscle. And after about what I recall is about 45 seconds, I took her hand and moved it back. I waited a couple of minutes because I just didn't know what to do or say. And then I got up and left the room. The victim would later come out and detail what happened. According to her, in 1973, at the tender age of 10, she would often spend the night at Stephen's house to visit her relative, his wife. The girl slept in the guest bedroom. One night, after Stephen got out of the shower, he came into her room with only a towel on. As she lay there in shock, she said that a 25-year-old Stephen removed the towel and completely exposed himself to her. He then took her hand and put it on his genitals while he touched and rubbed her. This was not an isolated incident, but something that would go on for years. The victim tried to prevent these attacks by pretending to be asleep to no avail. And this incident would be a dark secret that he kept hidden for decades. Minus the victim and Stephen himself, no one knew about his sick, sinister, twisted side, since he only ever portrayed this loving, kind, compassionate persona that would make millions fall in love with him decades later. By 1975, Stephen was cast in his first movie, All the President's Men, working alongside Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. This movie was a hit, and to this day is considered a classic. Stephen would move seamlessly between films, theater, and television. After filming one episode of the iconic show Charlie's Angels with Farrah Fawcett in 1976, he landed a lead role in Star Trek. While he was filming this movie, he and his wife Marjorie divorced in 1978. His performance in this franchise wasn't well received, and the movie underperformed tremendously. Feature is a child. I suggest you treat her as such. Child? Yes, Captain. A child. Evolving. Learning. Searching. Instinctively needing. Needing what? Spock. This child is about to wipe out every living thing on Earth. Now, what do you suggest we do? Spank it. Star Trek opened on December 7th, 1979, with the premiere shortly before that. In an interview, Stephen is quoted saying, I hadn't seen the movie. Almost no one had seen it. Jeff Katzenberg had called me about two weeks before and said, you're going to be the biggest thing in Hollywood. I really appreciated that, and I'd wish he'd been right. The movie didn't impress the critics, and I didn't think I was very good. Steven didn't let his lackluster performance or the low ratings of this movie stop him. In 1982, he landed the lead role in the short-lived but much-loved television series, Tales of the Gold Monkey. The show lasted for one season and was canceled. What happened to Tales of the Gold Monkey? Well, its future seems to be a bit up in the air at the moment. Um, we did sort of respectably all year, and we had a wonderful time making the show. And uh, it's on in reruns all summer, and I think if uh, every person in the United States watches it next week, I mean, every person, then, then they might bring it back next year. I don't know. I think it Definitely might. The ratings, right? <laughs> Our show, it's a, it's a touchy subject because the network promoted the show as best they could, I think, without saying we're doing Raiders. Uh, they, they tried to make the public think that. But we really, truly, were not trying to do ourselves. Those of us who were making the show weren't thinking about Raiders at all. And I think anybody who has seen a lot of episodes knows that there's much more of a I don't know. You have to get to know characters much more in a television series than you do in a in a film. And Raiders was a was an extraordinary film, which, by the way, I haven't even seen. I think I'm the only person on the planet no, who hasn't seen no, it. No, no, two of two us. Two of us haven't. Tina hasn't seen it. Three so of us. three of us. Oh, we'll all go after the show. It's playing somewhere. But uh, we were we were really doing something other than that. Though the show was short lived, Stephen earned an Emmy nomination for his work. But that wasn't the only thing he gained on the show. He also found love as he fell in love with his co-star, actress Faye Grant. Faye was initially attracted to Stephen because she found him to be nice, kind, loving, and a real gentleman. Little did she know, there was a monster that dwelt within. That same year, in 1982, Stephen's hidden dark side resurfaced when he exposed himself again, this time to a 14-year-old girl. There were two times in 1982 when I... It's really... <clears throat> I exposed myself. The look on the one in 1982 was such that it immediately just 
stopped everything cold. It was clear that she was disoriented and frightened, and that just made me want to stop and cover up, and I did. The incident in 1982, um, God help me, took, took advantage. That's not the right word, but I, I acted impulsively. Again. I think taking advantage may be Well, it, maybe it is term. exactly the right word. Are you a pedophile? I do not fit the either clinical or dictionary definition of it, but I'm absolutely not. Like what happened in 1973, this incident was never reported, and Stephen moved on as if nothing happened. In 1985, he married then-girlfriend Faye Grant. Things were moving forward for the young man. His career was steadily progressing and expanding, and soon enough, so would his family. In 1989, the couple welcomed a daughter named Kate. But in 1994, his dark side reared his ugly head. He would expose himself again, this time to a 13-year-old girl. And years later, the victim would come out and share what really happened. I was home alone in the apartment one day, in the kitchen, cooking breakfast. And I happened to look up. I don't remember if the door was open or if it was a French door with a full view. But I noticed Mr. Collins walking by, carrying a load of laundry, and he was completely naked. What do you mean he was completely naked? Uh, he, he didn't have any clothes on whatsoever. He had a wad of clothes in his hands. And, you know, walking through the courtyard, and I was taken aback. That was strange. I, you know, I'm like, wow, who, who does that? <laughs> then another day later, I had asked one of the neighbors about that because, I, you know, it stuck with me. I did think that it was extremely bizarre behavior. We don't run around naked here. Um, and she told me that he had just been filming in France. So, of course, my Oklahoma mind goes, oh, okay, you know, it's France. Yeah, <laughs> weird, whatever. It's an aberration. I can live with it. Didn't think anything else of it. During this trip, I had brought my Atari, and that dates, dates me a little bit, so that I would have something to do. But I had forgotten the adapter that hooked the Atari up to the television. So once that adapter arrived, I had no idea how to hook it up. I happened to run into Mr. Collins in the courtyard at that point in time, and I was explaining to him, and he said, oh, he could give it a go. He could probably fix it for me. So I invited him into my aunt's apartment, and I took him into the living room where the TV was, and he started to attempt to fix this. I don't know at what point he did this, but when he turned around, his pants were completely unfastened. His was hanging out. And I'm just shocked. He, de he doesn't make any mention of it. He doesn't act any different. So I decided, okay, you know, again, this is really weird, but I'm going to play along. And I didn't say anything either. I just acted like it was not out. <laughs> what was going through your mind? Were you nervous? Did you think he was going to approach you with his exposed? Um, Honestly, up until this point, I'm 13. I've never even kissed a boy. This is not something that I was even prepared to deal with. More or less, I kind of just shut down. He was he was acting normal, so I was determined to act just as normal. I'm keeping an eye level. I'm not, you know, my whole thing at that time was not to respond. I didn't want to be rude. He was fixing something for me. I was appreciative of that. So, he did he, he did his thing, I you know, and then he left. So now I'm laying out, you know, by myself in the apartment complex and he comes home and he sat down beside me and we were having a conversation and he made mention of some memorabilia from the movie or from the show Tales of the Gold Monkey that he had in his apartment. So he asked me if I cared if I you know, if I wanted to come over and look at the stuff that he had. During the, the time that I'm looking at this memorabilia, he asks me if I care if he gets more comfortable. So he walks back to his bedroom and he comes back out into the living room and he is completely nude. And I mean, it's my heart just fell. I, how do you deal with that? How, you know, again, I'm 13. I've never even kissed a boy. This is a, a random stranger that I don't really know that's done something so outrageous, now I'm not sure how to handle it. And I remember sitting on the couch and not wanting to be rude to him, not knowing how to get out of there. I'm, I'm just as tight as I can be, legs together, arms together, going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. He is nonchalantly 
fixing some light that's three feet away from me. It's a standing light. I think he's changing a light bulb possibly, but it puts his genitalia right on my eye level. So it's like, it's almost like you're looking everywhere, but you can't help but see it. I'm sitting on that couch wondering how I am going to extricate myself from this terrible situation, not be rude, not flip out, and then all of a sudden, like a ray of sunshine, here comes my aunt walking by the window. She had come home early, and I saw her, and it was like, there's my aunt, got to go by, and bolted from the door. I, there was not a chance for him to make a comment to me, nothing. She was my lifeline, she was my saving grace, and out the door I went. Sadly, though, these incidents were never reported, and Stephen moved on like nothing happened. He would, however, instead exhibit to the world that he was a devoted husband and father. 1996 would be a busy year for Stephen, as he starred alongside actress Diane Keaton in the popular star-studded movie The First Wives Club, as well as the made-for-TV movie The Babysitter Seduction, alongside Carrie Russell, where he played the part of a wealthy dad preying on his kid's nanny. There's no question that Stephen's career was steadily progressing, but he hadn't quite made his big break in Hollywood yet. That would soon change. The WB Network was looking for a more wholesome show as they felt TV had become too sexual. There were a lot of people who thought the television was out of control, that there was too much sex, too much violence, and nothing suitable for families, especially children, in what used to be called the family hour. They wanted to create a show about a functional family with a mom and a dad, who would be the man set to play this functional, non-character flawed parental figure for America, actor Stephen Collins. Stephen Collins, a man with a very dark past for raising minors, was set to play a minister father with moral values and Christian principles. He would frequently be around children, a demographic that he targeted. A pilot episode, you didn't even know that my character Eric Camden was a minister until halfway through. I thought it'd be great to have a show that portrays a minister with a sense of humor and a sex life. In August 1996, Seventh Heaven premiered on the WB Network and was a hit reaching number one and winning many awards, with TV Guide naming it the best show you're not watching. Little did the public know, America's perfect TV dad was actually a predator. Sarah died because she was driving the car and a kid went out in front of her. I know that! And that's my fault too! It's all my fault! Stephen Collins directed this special episode. So for me, the, the what was satisfying about it was to create an atmosphere where Bev felt safe becoming as emotionally naked and vulnerable as she had to be to do it. As Stephen's career took off, things at home between him and his wife were rocky as the couple found themselves on thin ice. Why? Well, after seeing Stephen on TV portraying Reverend Eric Camden on the popular show Seventh Heaven, one of his victims wrote Faye a letter depicting the abuse she endured at the hands of him decades prior. In the year 2000, the victim, who was now married, sent an anonymous letter to Faye telling her that Stephen Collins was a child murderer. This news shocked Faye to the core, because at that point, she considered her marriage to be a fairy tale. My involvement is, honey, could you move the table three feet over there? And I'll say, well, what about, and she'll just, just move it three feet over there. <laughs> but you know, it might just... Stephen, just move the table. So, so he just does what I say? I, that basically. Flabbergasted, she confronted Stephen about the contents in this letter. He responded and said that, quote, he had a hole in his jeans, as was the style back then, and that the victim saw his genitals through them on one occasion. Faye took what he said at face value and didn't respond to the victim's letter until 12 years later in 2012. In court documents, Faye alleges that Stephen confessed to living a secret life in January 2012, which caused the two to separate. She next alleges that the two tried to repair their marriage by going to marriage counseling. It was there when she alleges that Stephen admitted to engaging in long-term patterns of sexually abusing minor children, including sexually molesting three young girls over a decade ago. Upon Stephen's confession, Faye would finally respond to the victim's letter acknowledging her truth which then led to an open investigation with the New York City Police Department. At some point, Stephen unexpectedly served Faye with divorce papers, and the battle was on. 
the two fought over everything. She requested half of his fortune on the grounds that the actor earned nearly $3 million a year when they were together. She also requested spousal support and half the value of two luxury properties in California. The divorce was getting nasty, but things were about to get even worse. Unbeknownst to Stephen, Faye was cooperating with the New York Police Department, who had opened an investigation, and she secretly recorded their therapy session where Stephen admitted to a minor girls. When you exposed yourself to my 10-year-old sister, did you have an erection? No. I mean, no. Partial? Maybe. Partial erection? Maybe, yes. How did you talk to her? What kind of things did you say? What is it? What? What is it How did you talk to her? What kinds of things did you say? The exposure happened a couple of times. A couple of times? You told me I, once. No, I said on the list it happened several times. I said on the list. Several times? Oh, yes. you have to understand I was being shot in the face with a shotgun. So I, several times. It happened. With a 10 year old. Okay. Well, you know, it was, she was 11 and then like 12 and 13. Well, this isn't a disclosure, and I told you before, there was one instance where for, there was one moment of touching where her hand, I, I put her hand on my... You put her hand on Yes. The audio from that session leaked to the public, and Collins received severe and immediate backlash. He was dropped from several jobs, shows, and his reputation was ruined. At some time. Well, he was the lead actor in a film called Penance that we had. It's a short film. It made it to our finalist level, and that's uh, something that we don't take lightly. It, he plays a priest that is a pedophile, and uh, he's questioned by the other actor in the, in the short film. And we just thought it was tough subject, subject matter, and, and we, we kind of took it for what it was worth, a great artistic piece. And then eventually, uh, as the news started to break, chills kind of went up our spine and the hair stood up in the back of our neck. And, you know, it's just one of those things that are just really uncanny when art imitates life like that. It was a stellar performance. I mean, it was really, um, we don't give a Best Acting Award at Catalina, but what, this would have been in, in the consideration. Uh, both of the actors are so on point and, and they truly have that emotion driving behind them. And it was uncanny, um, especially after the news, you know, because it was portrayed so well. And uh, if anyone sees the piece, I think they'll really understand um, how, uh, how, how, how we saw it. And it was just, I'm, um, you know, it, we were a little speechless when all of this came out. I don't have a position on how he's going to resolve his own problems in real life, but I, I think as far as the filmmaker's concerned and the way you would, you know, handle this, first of all is to be delicate with it, um, but I think at the same time that's also the, the premise that they wrote, produced, and shot this film for. I mean, it was somewhat in a way to bring awareness to this issue. I mean, it's, it's, it's sensitive subject matter to begin with. So I think in light of the fact that these new allegations arose, I'm not sure it should change the filmmaker's approach to how he was trying to bring this subject matter to light. But on December 18th, 2014, Stephen Collins would sit down with Katie Couric for the first time. Did you find this sexually gratifying? Not at all. I mean, not at all. It was not exciting. It was not gratifying. There was no gratification. Then why did you do it? It was a combination of poor impulse control, arrogance, 25-year-old arrogance. In her declaration, Faye wrote the following, quote, I believe that Stephen used his celebrity status to engender the trust of families of the children he harmed. I further believe that there have been other victims, but he has thus only confessed to those three girls. She continued, quote, Stephen admitted that one of the victims lived in Los Angeles while the other two resided in New York. He said that the two victims in New York were apparently 
over the course of several years, from ages 10 to 14 years old. Due to the statute of limitations, Stephen has not been held criminally responsible for his actions. So where is he now? Well, the Daily Mail writes, quote, Disgraced actor Stephen Collins is living in a small town in Iowa. The 72-year-old actor lives in Fairfield, Iowa with his wife, 32-year-old Jenny Nagel. According to the article from 2019, Jenny was a super fan of Collins when he starred in the TV drama Seventh Heaven. They write, quote, She posted nearly 10 years ago about her love for the series and his character. They continue, The two enjoy their quiet life out of the spotlight and meditate often together. Reverend Camden may have fallen from grace, but he says he's constantly atoning for the harm he caused three young girls years ago. I think of those women. Every day. And I would say, with all my heart, I am sorry for what I put you through. And I want you to know that nothing like that will ever happen again. In real life, I know that you're a person of faith. Has this made you lose faith or has it made your faith stronger? In the church, Christ says in so many ways, bring me that which about you which is broken. Bring it. I'm a human being. I have faults and I've done things that I deeply regret, but I also know that I have a really good heart and um, that in spite of these things, uh, it, it, that I'm a good man trying to be a better man. Save the children. Save, 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 save the children. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Philadelphia. The Juvenile Lupus Association. Thank you. And the children. Thank you.